Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us today. We are joined by Roger Hernandez. He's a member of the California State Assembly. He also chairs the Assembly's Labor and Employment Committee, which I'm sure is exciting, invigorating, and challenging. Undoubtedly. Thank you for having me. Please. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to get a sense from you, sir, about how you as chair of one of the most important committees in the Assembly balance the desire to support the workers, but also to create a favorable and friendly business environment. Well, I'll tell you, here in California, uh, it's no easy task. Right. It is where uh, a significant convergence takes place because both communities are very significant in California. Uh, but we pride ourselves as Californians as being a state where we are very mindful of workers and workers' rights. Right. Probably the best, strongest worker protections are here in California, more so than in most any other states. But here's the challenge. When you speak with members of the business community, and I don't just mean advocates, I mean even small business people, mm -hmm. they have spoken time and time again about how California's regulatory environment is overburdensome. They also may throw in that the tax environment is overburdensome, but if you really look at studies, California's tax environment is probably middling compared to other states. The regulatory environment, that's where we really get hammered. Uh, you know, I gotta tell you, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, most comparisons, when it comes to the taxation, we are right in the middle. Right. Even though most, many folks, particularly out of the bigger business community, will say that we're number one in right. taxation. You're, that's not correct. We Especially are Especially with R&D credits that we have. Right, I mean, we right. may have some higher sales tax, but we have some great R&D credits, et cetera. Absolutely. Well, this, this legislature is working hard today to look at where we can make it easier on the regulatory side to keep California a very comfortable place for business to want to be. And, and I've heard that. And I've heard that from Democrats, from Republicans. Even the governor has said we have too many damn regulations. So if you have bipartisan support on the question of the regulatory environment, where do we go from here? Well, today in the legislature, there's a, a number of bills that are looking at uh, tightening up uh, where there's duplicative bills right. that require a lot of redundancy. Let's get rid of some of the redundancy to create more fluidity. Uh, today the, uh, uh, in the legislature, we've passed a bill out of urgency. It was a speaker's bill mm -hmm. that is going to allow uh, the state business licensing permitting office to move uh, at light year speed as compared right. to past months and past years. So and additional we'll funding, is that what it was? Was it, more funding given? Absolutely. Right. And that funding is actually coming from the state assembly's budget. So it's, there's no new taxation. The state assembly is saying, we're going to give a portion of our funding out of our, for our state house and our right. operations to fund this office so that business can grow quicker here. Now you have a bill uh, that deals with business contracts. Yes. And you have a concern, and it's one that's been expressed not necessarily only by you, but by cities throughout the state. Right. And it deals with contracts that automatically renew. That's correct. Explain that and what you're looking to do. Well, what I'm looking to do is to eliminate contracts that are worth a quarter million dollars or more okay. to the entity uh, that automatically renew themselves. It's critical that if a tax, if a, if a governmental agency, whether it's a county agency or a municipality, if they're uh, uh, granting contracts that are funded by taxpayers or ultimately one way or another paid by contractors, it could be as rate payers, right. that uh, there's accountability, that there's competition for these contracts, and that we're not giving out these lifetime contracts. But, but my question is, and you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I used to be a lawyer in my other life, and sure. lifetime contracts, that, those really, you can challenge those. I mean, anything beyond seven years, if I remember correctly, I mean, they seem a bit, it's shocking to me that, right. that, that anyone would, I mean, why would someone enter into a contract like this? Why would a governmental entity do that? Well, uh, there's a vast uh, array of uh, responses to that. I don't think there's always one reason. I understand. And it also depends on the kind of people that are elected to office. Uh, I think you want to enter in a long-term contract if you're, uh, considerate to the fact that some of the equipment uh, or facilities require some long-term lease agreements or long-term payout agreements with banking and fi financiers. But uh, we don't need these contracts to be lifetime contracts. So what is the business community saying? I and mean, we talk about that balance. Right. I mean, I could see both sides of the argument if I were part of a business council. Uh, the business community, uh, in terms of the, for example, the Chamber of Commerce, has not come out against my bill, uh, but the trash hauling industry, which tend to be the most lucrative contracts that municipalities can give out, uh, they're starting to speak out vocally against it. It's interesting you say that because I know that you had been a member of the West Covina City Council, yes. and I have heard from 
one of your, I don't know if he was your former colleague, because I don't know if you overlapped, but there are some concerns about trash hauling contracts in your city. Absolutely. And so, and you're not the only city. West Covina is not the only city that has that issue. And so it's interesting that you bring that up. Well, I can tell you right now, we have the same trash hauler in West Covina that exists in, in Redondo of Beach. Right. And that same trash hauler uh, provides the same service in West Covina and Redondo Beach. The only difference is that in West Covina, they're only about two, three miles away from Puente Hills landfill. Redondo Beach, we all know, is probably more than 25 sure. miles away. Guess what? Redondo Beach pays uh, less than half for the trash hauling service per resident, per household, than West Covina How residents. How did that happen? That's uh, bad negotiating and <laughs> bad, uh, and that's some bad voting and signing right. off on behalf of city council now, members. Now, are they lifetime contracts, just as an example? In West Covina, you know, in West know. Covina, well, in Redondo Beach, it is not a lifetime yeah, contract. Right. In West Covina, it is. Mm. And I, well, my concern, and I think the concern of members that are community members that are against these evergreen contracts, is that when you have an evergreen, it really uh, uh, it creates a chilling process on the right. ability for competition to come in and propose a more competitive rate, so competitive if, service. If this bill passes, does it look backward and invalidate? Can it? So this is what it does. Right. Uh, if it passes, it will invalidate all types of evergreens moving forward. forward right. And for those existing contracts that are evergreen that have this perpetuating uh, element to them, if they're found to have broken the law, it will immediately remove oh. that evergreen clause. So where do we go from here? How's it going? Uh, so How's the bill going? Uh, th this bill is going to be coming before its first co policy committee okay. uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I, I believe the support is there to get it out of policy committee and get it to the uh, assembly floor. Uh, this committee, uh, um, this bill has also enjoyed bipartisan support. There are Republicans that believe that there shouldn't be lifetime contracts, that there ought to be competition. And probably most importantly, on the Republican side of the aisle, as long in, in, in conjunction with the Democratic side of the aisle, is right. that there's nothing wrong with having competition and taxpayers getting uh, the best bang for their buck. Yeah, I mean, I could see the argument that the Democrats would present, different arguments that Republicans would present, and maybe you have a bipartisan solution. I yes. want to talk to you about our industry, the cable industry. Yes. Um, as you know, cable is heavily regulated by federal government, by the state government, and you have some concerns about how municipalities are using money that the cable industry is required to collect and pass off and back to the municipality. Yes, uh, Assembly Bill 185 is my uh, uh, community access mm -hmm. and the funding for community access channels uh, bill. It's a bill that basically is asking municipalities to use the franchise fees that come from the cable industry uh, wherever municipality is located, there's a franchise right. fee that is then uh, moved in the direction of the municipality's coffers. We're saying to cities, use a, a, a very small portion of those resources to fund the broadcasting of your governmentally required meetings, your city council meetings and your planning commission meetings. Why? So that people have sunshine. So people see how their dollars are being spent. So people can have a, a greater avenue of accountability over their decision makers. And you would think on the one hand, sunshine is a good thing but I'm sure that causes some nerves for some city councils up and down the state. Have they spoken out? Has the League of California Cities spoken out? Uh, we're working with the League of Cities today. The League of Cities has expressed some concerns, and some of those concerns are, concerns are reasonable. Uh, the concern may be for some of the smaller towns that maybe not have, find themselves with enough franchise fees I to understand. cover the cost, uh, that there might be an affordability issue, an economy issue. Uh, we have amended this bill to address some of the smaller towns, the 500, the 5,000 population towns where the economics don't play out. We've created enough amendments and off ramps or exclusions to, right. uh, that are reflective and supportive or understanding of that dynamic. So under your bill, would a webcast be permissible? Yes, under my bill, a webcast would be permissible because if the city couldn't finance or yeah, was I unable to finance. Right, because not too it. expensive to webcast. Not too expensive. I was going to say. His name is Roger Hernandez. We're going to have him back on the program. Roger, thanks for joining us. He's a member of the California State Assembly. He's also chair of the Labor and Employment Committee. I'm Brad Palmer, and you're watching Charter California Edition. How many cities are incorporated in the state of California? 361, 428, 482, or 522? 482 cities operate in California, 121 as charter cities, and 361 as general law cities. 
Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Jay Chen, he is the president of the Hacienda La Puente Unified School Board. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you, Brad. I want to speak with you about what could be a revolution in education funding in our state, really arguably the most revolutionary since Prop 13. The governor has proposed changing what's known as a local control funding formula whereby, and it's a two-part formula, if I can explain it to our viewers, the first step would be for every student that is either an English language learner, that is, comes from an economically disadvantaged home, or is in foster care, the school district will get a 35% bump. Mm -hmm. If that school district has more than 50% in those three categories, another 35% global bump. Right. What do you think about that? Well, I have to say, um, as a board member for Hacienda La Puente, our school, our school district would definitely benefit from the local control funding formula. Do you believe, you may not know the answer to this, mm -hmm. would you hit that 50% threshold in terms of students being either English language learners, economically disadvantaged, or foster care? I mean, I've driven through your communities. Mm -hmm. There are some beautiful areas and right. some more challenged areas. Yes, I do believe we would. Um, our district is, um, I think, over 40% free and reduced lunch meals. Ah, it so could be over right 50%. There. So that's and a very then good I have to presume that with English language learners, you do have a high Asian American population. Yes. Although that doesn't necessarily mean they're English language learners, but well, that could be. Yes, actually, our district is about seventy-five percent Latino. Ah, see, who knew? So right, th there are a lot of English language learners there, and then fifteen percent Asian American. Yeah, y it just so. shows that you you know you don't have a real sense of how communities are, especially with changing demographics. Mm -hmm. That being said. I, I think about some of your schools, and you have some very intelligent students, some very bright students. What this funding formula doesn't do mm -hmm. is it doesn't change how uh, students who may be gifted right. receive funding. And as I've said before, a bored, bright kid is a terror. Right. And so while I think I understand why we're focused on the neediest, uh -huh. the bright have needs as well. I completely agree with you, and that's why um, because we're not getting this kind of funding from the state or from the federal government, school boards have to push to make sure that we have the extracurriculars that can help challenge these students. Things like journalism, academic decathlon, science Olympiad. Our district has been very big on science Olympiad. Almost all of our schools participate. At the same time, as part of the, the carrot mm -hmm. to have school districts jump on board this new formula, the governor is really cutting strings between Sacramento and local school districts. He is going to give more control, more discretion to these school districts, mm -hmm. um, even if they get these additional kickers. Yes. And so while that may be attractive, with more control comes more responsibility. And that's what the, the people you know, have elected us to do, to make mm. these local decisions. And I think it's a smart move by the governor because you know, as you know, all of these districts are so, so completely different. Um, our school district is very different from San Marino versus right. Beverly Hills High versus Inglewood. And even within our own school district, there are huge differences between um, the demographics at Wilson. But, but let me let me Portland. ask you. I mean, I was reading the LA Times, and they were doing an example of what would happen to two school districts. Mm -hmm. The Hermosa Beach School District, which is a wealthier district, under the new formula, would receive about seventy-eight hundred dollars per pupil. Right. The Amino Charter High School District in Englewood mm -hmm. would receive about thirteen hundred five hundred per pupil. Now. That's a huge gap. I mean, yes. that means Amino is getting almost double what Hermosa Beach is getting. Right. Does that seem fair and equitable to you? It's well, hard to speak in a vacuum, but still. It's, um, I can understand how someone from Hermosa might not think it's fair, but we have to keep in mind two things. Number one, Hermosa's overall funding isn't decreasing. That is true. So other schools are increasing, Hermosa isn't being hurt. They're not increasing as much as others. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is it fair for a child to be born into poverty? Mm. Born to fa uh, a family with uh, parents who didn't go to college, who can't afford to send their kids to prep school, to after school SAT classes, et cetera. Right. So I think what we're trying to do is try to equalize. It's not easy. Opportunities. Yeah. Uh, in terms of equalizing opportunities, one of the great equalizers that California has attempted to uh, engage in would be what's known as adult education. Right. This isn't community college. Mm -hmm. uh, these are for adults that are trying to get ahead. Um, one would have thought that when one created adult education, it would be part of the community college system. I mean, it's for adults. Right. <laughs> and adults are community college age mm -hmm. um, or more. 
But traditionally, adult ed has been part of the K-12 system. Right. The governor is looking to change that. He mm -hmm. wants to move adult ed into community colleges, and he wants to do it now. He's ready to shift the funding to community colleges, and if it happens, it would start in the fall. Right. What do you think? Well, um, Hacienda La Puente, I'm going to put a plug, has one of the best adult education programs in California. Why? Um, we have just had a very strong program. We have a campus uh, at Willow, which is astounding. If you were to walk on it, you would think you were maybe at a community college. Really? So it's very, very strong. And I think the reason why a lot of K-12 schools have taken on adult education versus community colleges is because we're more distributed. So meaning where well oh, there I are more K twelve districts right. physically. Right. One of the I limitations for, geography. Exactly. Right. One of the limitations for adults is can they get to that campus? Right. And if we're only going to depend upon community colleges, well there are much fewer community colleges than there are. They could contract districts. with K twelves if they wanted to. They, they could. could. They definitely could, but then why not just leave it with K twelve schools that have been doing it? Now, I time. understand that some of your colleagues um, have been to Sacramento to right. talk about all of these issues. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing as you walk through the halls of Sacramento about what legislators believe? Look, the governor, you know, he has um, a lot of power. I don't use that term pejoratively. Right. You know, he has been able to move his agenda forward. I think the governor is also very open. Um, you know, he doesn't have, he has his agenda, but what he wants is, what's best for California when he hears what's being said. I and mean, even the California School Board Association, we've had meetings on this. Sure. As a whole, as school board members, we think also that, you know, uh, this should probably rely, uh, remain within our, our purview. Mm -hmm. So the reception we've gotten has been very good. There's been a lot of people going to Sacramento to say that adult education should remain with the schools that originated. I want to ask you about standardized testing. Yes. Continues to be a heated thorny issue for mm -hmm. so many school boards. Um, it's interesting. LAUSD, as an example, is imposing a system whereby 30% of a teacher's evaluation will be based upon standardized tests. At the same time, California Superintendent of Public Instruction is coming out against um, the flurry of standardized tests that has bombarded uh -huh. public schools in the state. Right. We're confused. Yeah. Where do we go from here? Well, on this question. I think our students are being tested to death. When I was in school, um, you know, we had the SAT. Everyone sure. took that. They wanted to go to college. We didn't have this we whole had those plethora. yearly exams. I remember right. we filled in the bubble and mm -hmm. there would be carbon paper. But I know it's a lot more in the public school system. Yes. But, but it really does beg the question. I mean, you want to have benchmarks, mm -hmm. but you don't want to overtest, arguably. But you want to see how a teacher is faring. Right. But is the standardized test the best way to determine how a teacher is faring? Well, because I think that's a good question to pose because then won't all teachers want to teach the highest performing students? Right. right? They'll only want to teach the honor students because those students end up with higher standardized test scores. But how else do you get a gauge of a teacher's performance? You know, you can sit in a classroom mm -hmm. for a day. I don't know if that really tells you mm -hmm. if this teacher is performing at his or her potential. I. I support peer evaluation, so that means teachers inputting into the evaluation. But don't they have a motive to take care of their own? I, you know, I think that they can be trusted. I mean, it wouldn't be the entire, of course, entire portion. I think that could be part of it, and also student evaluations. Now, when I was at Harvard University, we evaluated our yeah, professors. Yeah, you know, we, we do that in college. I, I'm an adjunct professor, and that can be done. Mm -hmm. So there's not a big That's difference tricky. between an 18-year-old and a 17-year-old. Well, arguably, maybe in high school that can be done. Where is Hacienda La Puente going on this question as an example of a school district in the state? Well, I do think that we need to have evaluations, and I do think that we should be find some way to reward the best teachers out mm. there. Something that I've proposed is, okay, it's very tricky to pay some teachers more, some pe teachers right. less. But what we can do is if we find a teacher, if we can agree that this teacher is very, very good, right. Let's see if they are willing to take more students in their class, expose more students to that teacher, and pay them proportionally more. His name is Jay Chen. He is the president of the Hacienda La Puente Unified School Board. I'm Brad Pomerantz. This is Charter California Edition. How much money does California spend on standardized testing each year? 15 million, 37 million, 54 million, or 68 million dollars? 
The state of California spends $54 million a year on standardized tests. It's Turner California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad to introduce you to Anthony Duarte. He is the treasurer of the Hacienda La Puente Unified School District School Board. Congratulations, sir. You were recently appointed to that school board. I believe it was in July of 2012. Talk to us about that appointment process. It's, it's unique. It is, it is. It, it's actually probably the first uh, in the history of Hacienda La Puente when the, when the right. districts merged in 1970. Um, you know, a longtime Bert member, Anita Perez, I had uh, retired right. after almost 20 years on the board, and the uh, school board members decided to do an appointment instead of a special election, which would have cost the district about $100,000, $150,000. What's so fascinating, and you explained this to me, you know, we have the Brown Act, and in yes. the, under the Brown Act, deliberations need to be in public. Correct. If there's a board of five, yes. you can't have more than two commiserating on a topic. Yep. And so what your school board decided to do is you, they held interviews in public, Mm -hmm. All of you were interviewed. Yes. They debated in public. Yes. They voted in public. What a unique democratic process. Yes, and a very uh, stressful process for no those doubt. that participated no in doubt. it. No doubt. And yeah. so you went through, did you say four rounds of voting? Four rounds of voting, yeah. There were six candidates. Uh, they opened up the, the application process to anyone in the community. They, you know, it was in the Tribune right. and six of us applied and we all interviewed in, in front of public in front of the entire board so i have to ask you what does your sister think being a junior at la puente high school a little embarrassed or pretty proud uh she was very proud yes. you know i i know a lot of the administrators at the high school there are a lot of them are products of, of right. la puente high school right. and you know they're saying that you know she walks around you know a little embarrassed but uh, very proud of her and brother. you went to la puente high no, no, I did. I went to uh, Nelson Elementary and then Sparks. Okay. And then I went to different but, high schools. But you are a product of I that am. school district. Yes. So it, it, it brings a lot of joy to be able to come back yeah. and, and give back to a district. And talk to me about that because it is not common, you know, with a community, you know, it's a fairly small size that you get to actually serve the community that served you. Yes, yes. You know, I had the opportunity of going back to my elementary school uh, over an issue they're having there, and the principal took me into a second grade teacher. Her name is Ms. Bodily. Was she yours? She was. I love that. And so I love she that. told the teacher, she goes, you may not remember this gentleman. You, he was probably this big when that you last saw him. Great. And she looked at me and she says, Anthony? <laughs> and I couldn't believe after all these years she remembered. And then we started talking about my career and right. what I'm doing and my involvement in the community. And she just started crying in front of oh, all her second graders. That is really, yeah. really inspiring. Speaking of your involvement, I want to talk to you about an organization in which you are involved. It's called Honor Pack. What does honor stand for? Or, or does it stand Honor, for anything? Is it an acronym? It's, a, it's an acronym and it means the same thing both in English and Spanish. I like that. So that's why they, 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 at the time the founders of the board. And the focus of Honor Pack is? Is to promote uh, LGBT Latino uh, candidates and causes. And so you are an LGBT Latino. Yes. And um, I have to think that your community, both communities, are very proud of your appointment. Yes. Um, and what's interesting about the LGBT Latino community in California is it has some real leaders. We have some I big mean, names in the Latino LGBT community. One could yes. argue the second most powerful individual in this state. Um, he's LGBT Latino. His name? His name is uh, Speaker John Perez. <laughs> Which yes. is really stunning yes. on so many levels. Although not stunning because why not? Yeah. I mean, he's a gifted operative for years mm -hmm. and years. But we have Ricardo Laura, member of the California State Senate. Robert Garcia who is vice mayor of Long Beach, Correct. recently appointed to the California Coastal Commission. Yes. Susan Telemonte is an assembly woman. Uh, she identifies as a lesbian. But there are also folks like yourself, school board members, yes. city council members. Give us a few names. Uh, you know, here in the San Gabriel Valley, and actually I think San Gabriel Valley has some of the, the most uh, Latino LGBT uh, elected officials. Right. We have, you know, Juanita Gonzalez, who's on the Amani Union School District Board. Uh, Adam Carranza, who's on the Mountain View Union School District Board. Uh, Brian Urias, who's on the Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District Board. And we actually have uh, David Vela, who's on the currently a Montebello Unified School right. Board member. And looking to join and the Community College Board. hopefully soon will be on the LA Community College Board, so yes. And let, let's talk about that, because as a general proposition, I think it's fair to say that the Latino community, while no doubt more aligned with the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and more progressive causes on issues relating to gays and lesbians, I think it's fair to say the community is evolving in yes. terms of its approach to gays and lesbians. 
I think about Proposition 8 mm -hmm. uh, when that was on the ballot in 2008, and the Latino community split about 50-50. Um, which one could argue was a bit of a surprise since mm -hmm. members of minority groups will often support members of other minority groups. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. How How is the Honor Pact received uh, okay. by the Latino yes. community, et cetera? I mean, by our, our fellow Latino elected officials, you know, we're, we're held with open arms. I mean, mm -hmm. we knew that uh, reaching the hearts and minds of the Latino community was going to take some work, and that's why Honor Pact in 2000, uh, a, took a leadership role in opening the only office in East LA mm. to promote uh, Prop 8 um, right. in the Latino didn't community. Didn't know on Prop 8. Didn't know on Prop 8, yeah. And so and that's, you know, we thought that that was important. And what's interesting, I'm sure you've seen these polls, that support for marriage equality in the Latino community is on the rise. Correct. So arguably, if Prop 8 was on the ballot today, you would see not a 50-50 split amongst Latinos, it. but it would be a higher percentage. So um, where does Honor Pack go from here? Because I, I presume that you know being Latino is but one part of your yourself. Mm -hmm. Being gay and lesbian is one part of yourself. I mean, you're a fully integrated right. human being. So you know, wh where does it go? You know, what, one of the things as as an LGBT Latino elected right. official is that's just you know being Latino is part right. of who right. we are, and and being LGBT is part of who we are. It doesn't make up us completely. Right. And, um, you know, one of the reasons we're seeing that shift in in marriage equality support is you know the more elected officials that are coming out as you know, Latino, LGBT, mm -hmm. the more that we come out to our families and people are seeing who we are, they're saying, you know, Mr. Duarte is no different than, you know, Mr. Chen on right. our board. Who's the you know, president you know, of the pres La Puente. President of yeah. La Puente. Uh -huh. um, you know, they both agree that, you know, students' education first, students' safety And he's first. a product of the district as well, right? He's also a product yeah, of So district. two young guys yes. that are on the board giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. Well, since you are a board member, let's talk about some issues facing the board. Sure. I recently spoke with Jay Chen, uh, who's the president, and one issue that's really interesting is adult education. Yes. Um, as you know, the governor is looking at shifting responsibility of adult education from K-12 to community colleges. I would have thought it would have been with community colleges since adults aren't really in K-12, but mm -hmm. be that as it may, uh, Mr. Chen is not a supporter of that shift, thinking that K-12 should continue to run adult ed. Where do you come down? Uh, I actually agree with my calling on this one, and I think our, our entire board on the Hacienda La Punta School District agrees that adult ed should remain uh, with K through 12. Why? You know, we've been doing it right. We've seen a lot of school districts who, unfortunately, because of a lot of the budget cuts over the year, have had to close, you know, their adult education or or, or cut in their mm -hmm. adult education. We actually, even though it's a small district in the Singapore Valley, had the second largest adult education program in the state of California, only that second says a lot. to LAUSD. Right, that says a lot. Um, and showing that we can we can meet the needs of our community uh, in providing you know career oriented. Well, let courses. me ask you then: the governor, a Democrat, mm -hmm. is in support of this plan. You yourself, Correct. I understand, are a Democrat. Correct. Recently, at the Democratic Convention of I Sacramento, was. and so. You know, how do you prevail upon the governor on this issue? You're part of the same party. He's, you know, fairly persuasive. You know, we don't, I, for, I have a lot of friends who are on the community college board, and I have yet to meet one community college board member who's actually excited on anxious. taking on this uh, challenge and with reduced funding Right. Uh, on top and, of that. And as I understand the plan, if it moves forward, this fall. Yes. I mean, the shift would happen immediately. I mean, we have over 20, I think it's between 20 and 25,000 adult ed students uh, that we're servicing right now in Hacienda La Puente, and I can't think of any community college, whether it's Mount San Antonio College right. or Rio Hondo, that can really take in that amount of students right now. It would be pretty quick and mm -hmm. pretty dramatic. Do you have a sense as to what's going to happen? You were in Sacramento recently. Were people discussing it? Uh, it, it was recently be, uh, before one of the assembly committees, right. and it uh, it wasn't it didn't move forward in the committee. It never got out of committee. So oh my! So it may have died. It, it may have. We don't know. We may see the end of that. You know, we'll we'll continue to keep our ears open. But in, in our final right, in our final moments, if someone wants to get involved in Honor Pack, mm -hmm. which supports, as you said, gays and lesbians running for office who are Latino, how can they get involved? Well, we Whether have, they're gay or lesbian or straight or whatever. It is. Yeah, and we have a lot of allies that support right. Honor Pack. You uh, know, they can go to our website www.honorpack.org. We have our very first uh, Inland Empire event coming up yes, in July. Yes, and Mark Chicano, yes, not a member of the Latino community, no, yeah. but a member of the gay and lesbian yeah, community. Yeah, the very first right. uh, openly gay person of color right. elected to the uh, U.S. House well, of Representatives. Well, congratulations again. His name is Anthony Duarte. He's running for his first election, November 2013. My name is Brad Palmer. This is Charter, California Edition. Thank you.